Let us worship our God by singing his praise from the words of Psalm 50. Psalm 50, the first version of that psalm, and we're singing verses 1 through 5. The mighty God, the Lord, has spoken and did call the earth from rising of the sun to where he has his fall. From out of Zion Hill, which of excellency and beauty, the perfection is God shine gloriously. Our God shall surely come. Keep silence shall not he. Before him fire shall waste, great storms shall round about him be. Unto the heavens clear he from above shall call, and to the earth likewise, that he may judge his people all. Together let my saints unto me gathered be, and those that by sacrifice have made a covenant with me. Psalm 50, first verse in verses 1 through 5, the mighty God the Lord has spoken. Let us now come together in prayer. Let us all pray. Our Lord and our God, we seek the grace to come before thyself under the terms of that our opening song of praise and of worship. We have come, O Lord, looking to thyself, the covenant-keeping God, the Almighty One, the thrice Holy One, enthroned in the heavens with the earth as thy footstool. Thy majesty, thy power, the perfection of thy character. Lord, may our soul linger on so many of these qualities that was given as a revelation of thyself to promote our worship and our praise. But especially, Lord, we bless thee for the gift of thy Son, for the wind which he came and gave the one thing vital, precious to himself, giving his life upon the cross for the sins of his people, so that we might go free as we trust and rely upon that finished and perfect work. And we pray, our Lord and our God, that as we come before thee as a gathered assembly of thy people once more this morning, our hope, our argument, our plea 
might rest upon that one finished and perfect sacrifice with the request, O Lord, that thou wouldst accept, that thou wouldst hear, and that thou wouldst answer us all and only for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son. We bless thee, O Lord, for the way in which our lives are decorated with goodness and mercies from our God. We thank thee for the way in which thine eye follows us every step that we take, and thine ear picks up on every cry that we issue. Thou art the one alone who art familiar with all the chaos and the mess of our own life and living. And we bless thee, O Lord, for the way in which, despite all these things about us, thy grace overshadows them and overrules and thou will bring blessing to enrich our souls, fill out our life, and bring satisfaction and peace to our soul. So, Lord, we pray that thou wouldst come amongst us individually this morning, the families that we gather with and we represent before thyself, the community of which we are a part, we ask our Lord and our God that thou wouldst look down upon us because whatever be the capacity we approach thee, we all of us stand in need of repentance and the work of thy spirit that we might discover more and more what is wrong with our life and how we need more and more the intercession of our high priest and the application of the perfect work of our Saviour and the very qualities that we look for for our, own, for our own blessing are the same qualities we would covet and make mention before thee for our nation and for our people. We see so much of people doing what is right in their own eyes. We see so much, Lord, of a blatant disregard of thy word. We see so much of a deliberate hostility to it all the while thinking that their way is the better way and that what they want to do is what they will achieve and do. And today we find so much of the problems in society analyzed by those in power seeking to explain and to rectify. And they fail in that responsibility because they do not look at the right foundation and cause and fountain. We are rebels against our God. And the things that are in our life are because of that rebellion and hostility. So draw us back to thyself, Lord, we pray. In the providences of daily life unfolding for us. Speak, O God, with a voice that we can understand and follow each one of us alone and apart. And we pray that there would be a greater outworking of thy spirit amongst us that thy word lodging in the heart of so many and in the memory will be quickened, have an influence and reset the balance of our thinking and of our living. Lord, we need thee. And so we ask thy blessing upon us and that thou was gathered in with us this day. The prayers, O oh Lord, that we have for ourselves in our need are multiplied yet further as we seek to embrace other churches, other preachers, the cause of the Lord in our own shores and overseas where we have an interest. For one and for all of these interests, Lord, be mindful of us. Think of us. We have no reason to expect that based on our own work or our own activities. But we hold on to what we were singing of that covenant thou hast made, and ask, O Lord, that as we hold it up before thee, thou wouldst be true to thy character and resolve, when thou didst say of old, I will be a God to these my people. May we know it, the reality of the experience, and the blessings bound up, intertwined with that relationship. So here is our God, Come in with us now, we ask, and bless us abundantly, richly, and graciously. And all the while, 
forgiving our faults and failings, especially in holy privileges and duties. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> When I arrived this morning, it was already pointed out to me, oh, the minister has a new car. My other one, it was 10 years I had it. It had 115,000 miles on the clock. And one time we were coming up from Drumnod Rocket up to Bewley and it was laboring, struggling. I got to the top in first gear and I really was concerned would I make it at all. A light came on in the dashboard. A flashing orange light. Something called the EGR valve. It's a valve that's used for recycling the gases in the exhaust. Let's leave that to one side. But this light came on to tell me that the valve wasn't working properly. Something was wrong with the car. Yes, as soon as we got to the top of the hill, it was just downhill, all the way into Bewley and all the way from there to Ballantour. There was no more hills and we were just going fine. Switched off in Ballantour, concerned. Next morning, switched on, no light. Driving around Ballantour, just fine. But then the slightest hill, if I were to climb up from the bridge over the Black Isle, the light would come on. When we were light, driving on the flat, we were happy, but we were always watching for that light. It would lose power when you started to climb. And I was told the best way of getting rid of it is just pull into a lay-by, Switch off, switch back on, and the light goes off. Great. But you always knew that the fault was there. You always knew that there was something wrong. It wasn't going away. It's just that you weren't seeing it all the time. It spoils the drive. You lose your confidence. Sometimes you felt it, sometimes it wasn't there. But you needed something new in the engine. You needed a new part for the car. And that's just like sin in our lives. Something goes wrong and we do something wrong. And there's that flashing light warning us and telling us that there's something wrong that needs to be addressed and to be put right. There are times when you're getting on through life and you don't remember, you don't have that flashing light in your conscience and you think, great. But the back of your mind, it comes in. I did this wrong. I did this sin. And it's always there troubling you, whether you see it or when you don't. You try to hide it, but you're only hiding it. It's still there. It needs to be dealt with. Your sin needs to be overcome. You need someone to deal with it. And the only way that that can happen is by Jesus Christ the Savior. He alone is able to take away that sin so that you never see it again. And he's the only one that can cover it up. There's a text in the Bible that says, the Lord will cast our sins into the sea of his forgetfulness. He puts them behind his back. And if you put something behind your back, you never see it again. And that's exactly what God has done with our sin. He has put them away. And they're never there ever again to confront us. 
So that's the lesson that made me go and get a new car. That little light flashing on the dashboard, that little warning in our conscience that we've done something wrong. Sometimes it's there and we see it. Sometimes we don't see it, but it's still there and has to be dealt with by Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue singing. This time's coming to a portion from Psalm 24. Psalm 24 and singing from the beginning, five stanzas. The earth belongs unto the Lord and all that it contains. The world that is his that is inhabited and all that there remains. <clears throat> For the foundations thereof he on the seas did lay, and he hath it established upon the floods to stay. Who is the man that shall ascend into the hill of God? Or who within his holy place shall have a firm abode? Whose hands are clean, whose heart is pure, and unto vanity, who hath not lifted up his soul, nor sworn deceitfully. He from the eternal shall receive the blessing him upon, and righteousness even from the God of his salvation. Psalm 24, 1 through 5, the earth belongs unto the Lord. morning is from the New Testament from the Gospel of Matthew and we're going to chapter 27 and reading from verse 50 to the end of that gospel. So picking up a reading from Matthew's gospel chapter 27 and reading from verse 50. Let us read and hear God's word. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph 
and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Philip and begged the body of Jesus. Then he went to Pilate, rather, and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre he made be made sure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He's risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye. For I know that ye seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from that sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they came to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they meet, see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch or the guards came unto the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen, and may the Lord grant to us blessing and understanding in that reading of his own word. Continuing singing praise, this can come into Psalm 16 and from verse 7. Psalm 16 from 7 to the end of the psalm, I bless the Lord because he doth by counsel me conduct, and in the seasons of the night my reins do me instruct. Before me still the Lord I said, since it is so that he ever stand at my right hand, I shall not move it be. Because of this my heart is glad and joy shall be expressed, even by my glory, and my flesh in confidence shall rest. Because my soul and grave to dwell shall not be left by thee, nor wilt thou give thine holy one corruption to see. 
Thou wilt me show the path of life, of joys that is full store before thy face. At thy right hand are pleasures evermore. Psalm 16, 7 to the end, I bless the Lord. Would you turn me back to the reading we had this morning, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, and the very familiar words of verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. We're going to look at the resurrection in different facets, both morning and evening, today as the Lord enables and this morning, I want us simply to look at the resurrection, the event. And tonight, I want us to look at the resurrection, the effect. The event of the resurrection this morning, the effect of it this evening. Any kind of great commander going into a battle will gather as much information as he needs the information about himself and his army and as well as the enemy and those against him, the geography of the battlefield and the different dangers and advantages gained. He will assess the, real, the ability of his own resources and all of the different war games that he can engage in. He might then focus upon some vital factor in the battle, if it's a hill to be caught, a bridge to be defended, water to be insecure. And the importance of that event will be determined by the strategy that is used to achieve it. Just how important the target is will be shown by just what he throws at it, the tactics that are used and the time that is given to achieve it. And all of these qualities apply in the spiritual realm as well. From the very start, the very start of the ministry of the Lord, the significance of his coming and his ministry and the purpose of his death were more than obvious and known to the devil. Because right at the very beginning, there's the intent to distract 
to turn the Lord away from that great purpose. As soon as he embarked on his public ministry, there was that threefold temptation. Go on a bit further and we find Peter, when the Lord again made that intimation, far be it from the Lord to do that, I won't go that way and I'm going to stop and defend against it happening to you. And even in the story we've read here this morning, we read the way in which there was the possibility of putting out a false account about the empty tomb where it to appear. That resurrection the disciples were speaking about that the Lord had told them of, they were there concocting a story to make it acceptable that, well, the disciples came and stole the body. They were all of them attacking what was basic and vital and crucial. There was an onslaught of attack upon the Lord, his death and his resurrection because all of these were central to the gospel that we have here this morning. And the centrality of the resurrection is worked out by Paul in one of his letters to the church in Corinth. There were problems there and he addressed them and he addressed them and he kept on giving them wise counsel. And right at the very end, he took up the biggest problem of all. Now, what are you saying about the resurrection? What are you saying about it? That's what, Pete, that's what Paul was going to do. The resurrection was under attack then, and it's under attack now. There was hostility deployed about it and against it to reduce it or to remove it. Because the resurrection is a very central issue in the gospel we have. The people in Corinth were paying far, far too much attention to what people were saying. And they weren't listening to what God was saying. And that applies then and applies now. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, his burial and his resurrection were all intertwined with the observance of the Old Testament Passover. The Passover takes place on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Difficult formula, but that's the way it's worked out. The first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. It can't happen sooner than the 21st of March, but from then onwards, it's possible. And in that resurrection, we're confronted with the amazing love, the abundant grace, and the provision of God in giving his own son to be the savior of his people. And the death of Jesus Christ deals with the biggest problem, sin. And it deals with the last enemy, death. And the Lord Jesus Christ confronted both of these problems, overcame them, and defeated them. And when you go back to the ministry of the Lord, when he had his disciples with him, on many occasions, he tells them of what his life is going to achieve and the purpose of his coming. Mark chapter 10, he begins to tell them the story. And he says, I must, I must. There's a compulsion First and foremost, in the way the Lord speaks to his disciples, there's a compulsion about his coming, his dying, and his resurrection. When you move on from Mark chapter 8 into chapter 9 at verse 31, the Lord repeats that same teaching to the disciples. 
But we're told in the very next verse, they didn't understand it. And so you move from Mark chapter 8 to Mark chapter 9, and you come into Mark chapter 10. And again at verse 32 and 33, the Lord is again telling the disciples that's how crucial it was. That's how vital it was. He keeps telling them, repeating it, that he's going to die, but also he's going to rise again from the dead. We see the importance of that in the very activity at the end of this our reading this morning, the way in which these leaders came and said, well, this is what you said, and we want to counter it, and we want to set up a way of denying it happening. And these leaders said, what did he do? What did he say? They quoted the teaching of the Lord that he said he would rise again after three days. So that's what we've got to count on. This is the teaching. This is the way in which the Lord taught the disciples. This is what lingered in the teaching and the community of the grassroots of his day. That he was going to die. But also that he was going to rise. So often people stop just at the cross. They take all the teaching and they stop at the cross. That's not enough. You've got to go on because the Lord went on and spoke also about his resurrection. It's central. It's vital. Somebody once did a summary of 13 service, 13 sermons in the book of Acts. And of these 13 sermons, nine of them went on past the cross to talk about and to teach off the resurrection. We preach a dying Savior. We preach an empty cross. And we preach an empty tomb. Simply because of this verse, our text this morning, he's not here. He's risen. But it's not enough to say he's risen. The Bible tells it to us even more pointedly and sharply. God raised him. The resurrection was the bold intervention of God, almighty God, into the history of mankind. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 tells it plainly. God makes a declaration. A declaration to the whole world concerning Jesus Christ, his son. So what is God speaking about? And what is God saying to you and to me about and through the resurrection? What's its meaning? What's its significance? All I want to do this morning is to take the resurrection as it touches on many, many different themes and lessons we're familiar with in our Bibles. But to listen in each one of them what God is saying to you and to me. So first of all, I want us to think of what is the resurrection saying about Jesus Christ, the Savior? We already mentioned in Mark chapter 8, 9, and 10 the way in which he was preparing his disciples, the uniqueness of his death and the uniqueness of his resurrection. But what did it mean for Jesus Christ himself? This. There is the seal and approval of God on his life and on his death. There's the seal and approval of God on the life and the death of Jesus Christ. That's what the resurrection meant for Jesus. So let's unpack it. To understand the death of Christ, we've got to look at it through Old Testament glasses and scripture. He fulfilled all the teachings of the Old Testament. The sacrificial lamb. Given to address the sins of his people. 
The way in which there was blood shed, covering up the sins and protecting the house as it was applied to the lentils of the door. He is the one, that lamb is the one that carries the sin away into the wilderness, apart from and away from the people. The lamb, the picture, the image that Jesus Christ fulfilled, offering himself as a sacrifice for his people. To make his people ready to appear before a holy God. The teaching we're all so familiar with. He took the cup. And in that cup there was all the sins of all of his people. And he drank that cup to the very last drop. He stood in the place as the substitute for his people. And he took all that the justice of God demanded and would inflict upon those who were sinners. He stood in their place. He took that to himself. They were all transferred to his book, to his soul, to his life. And he took responsibility for them. And he dealt with them. So there you have it. We're all familiar with the events of the cross and the resurrection. But in it all, there's a question lingering in the air. In it all, yes, he's done all that. But is it acceptable? Is it enough? Will it suit for me when I appear before God for you if you're trusting in Jesus Christ? Will it meet the standards of God? Or is it all in vain? How does God answer that question in my soul or in yours? It's a huge question that hangs in the air because the issues of eternity and the destiny of my soul depends on the answer to that question. The sinner is looking for the assurance that all is well. We're looking, we're looking, we're looking for something to answer the question. How? How is it answered? I want to take an image from the book of Psalms. Psalm 89 and verse 15. Let me read it. We may be familiar with it. Oh, greatly blessed the people are, the joyful sound that know. In brightness of thy face, O Lord, the ever on shall go. It's one line, but it covers a huge experience because there they were. There's the temple and the tabernacle and the meeting place with God. And into that place, the high priest would go. He was dressed with all the refinery and the garments of the high priest. He dressed with all of the colors and the garments round about him. And he went in there to act on behalf of the people, the tribe of God's people. And every one of these people were standing at the door of their tent. Watching. Waiting to see if the high priest would come out again from God's presence, to see if it was acceptable what he had done. He was there waiting, waiting. And they were listening. And what is it they hear? Round the bottom of the garment of the high priest, there's a lot of little bells. And whenever the high priest starts to walk out again, the bells would start ringing. And the people would listen and they would again now be joyful. Yes, he's alive and he's coming out. And what he's done is acceptable before God. There we have the joy of Easter in the Old Testament image. Oh, greatly blessed the people are. The joyful sound that know. The tinkling of the bells knowing the high priest is coming out. That God has accepted the work that he's offered. That's the comfort. 
the seal of approval upon Jesus Christ. A declaration that God is making to all the world that what Jesus Christ has done is well-pleasing, is acceptable, is sufficient. The declaration by the resurrection. When King Charles was being crowned at the Market Cross in Edinburgh, a herald stood. He was dressed in all of the historical garments, in all of the refinery of that ancient dress. And he made a declaration concerning the king in Westminster. And here we have God making a declaration, not just simply for the people on the streets of Edinburgh, but he's making a declaration to all the world that he's pleased and satisfied with the work of Jesus Christ. And that is a great, great comfort to the believer. We can go and look at him, trust in him, and we can put our hope in him because we know that God will accept that work if we're trusting in it. There is a benefit, can I put it like this? There's a benefit sometimes in adopting the opposite direction in an argument. What if, what if, what if? Well, that's what Paul is doing when he wrote to the Corinthian church. He says, what if, what if Jesus Christ did not rise? There's nothing. That's what we're going to look at in a minute. But Jesus Christ did rise. And there is a hope and there's a prospect and there's a pardon and a peace. The burden has been dealt with. The problem has been removed. God is speaking to you and me. And he tells us that the work is acceptable. What then are we doing with this message? Are we trusting in it and in him? So yes, what does it say about Jesus Christ? There's the seal of approval. But two other things, just very briefly. There is also the declaration that he is the son of God. He claimed to be son of God. He claimed the right to give eternal life. He claimed the right to call people from the grave and he claimed the right to be the judge of all men. Bold and challenging these claims were. Yet he died. He died in apparent weakness on a cross, a mark of shame. What now then? What now then of everything that this teacher taught us? It's all at risk. It's all at risk because of the way he died. Can we, dare we ignore it? Dare we avoid it? No, we dare not. He rose victorious over the grave. All he said was true. And we can disregard it at our peril. Right at the very beginning of Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 11, at his beginning of the ministry, there was that angel announcement from heaven. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was a repetition. This is my beloved son. Listen to what he's got to say. The resurrection declared that he was indeed the Son of God. But not only the Son of God, the resurrection is also declared and made clear that he is King of Kings. Again, think of the wise men. They came looking for a king. Where is he? Oh, he's out there on the cross. The board above his head says, King of the Jews. 
Is this the king? To answer that question, we've got to go back to Philippians chapter 2. And there, Paul is taking the life of Jesus Christ, and he says, yes, this is what happened. We start with the incarnation, and we go down the steps, and we go down the steps, and we go and look at the life of Jesus in all of these steps, humbling himself. And the very lowest step was what? He died on a cross. That's how low the Lord Jesus Christ went. And there the logic of God kicks in. The logic of God kicks in at that point and it says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee bow and every tongue confess. The resurrection was the indication that Jesus Christ indeed is the king. And every day, one day coming, everybody will acknowledge that and confess it. The question lingers. Do we have that confidence and that trust? Or to put it bluntly and plainly like this, the God in heaven has made his opinion known. He's given his assessment. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to what he's got to say very well. Are you listening? Are you listening to what Jesus Christ is saying, what God is saying about his son? And in a service like this in the morning, Jesus Christ is on trial. Every one of us is coming to an opinion about him. Every one of us is forming an assessment about Jesus Christ. He's on trial here this morning. But one day that will be reversed. And we will be on trial. And we will be asked, what do you say about Jesus Christ, my son? He will be our judge. And everything will be reversed from what's happening here today. So yes, that's the most important thing. What it says about Jesus Christ. What does the resurrection say? But I want to go on much more briefly, but I want also to take up what does the resurrection say about the gospel in our hands? We've already hinted at it when we think of what Paul was saying to the church in Corinth. What if there is no resurrection? Then there's no content to your faith. There's nothing worthwhile. There's nothing that makes a difference. But the church in Corinth knew it did make a difference. Because they knew the power of that resurrection. Transforming them from the way they lived. And the people in Corinth were pretty ropey. Walking in the gutter kinds of people. But they knew the touch of God and the power of that resurrection. And the Christian faith was full of substance, was full of power, brought them peace and changed their lives. That's, yes, what the gospel is. And we can take it resting upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He invites us to come. He invites us to come weary in our hearts, guilty in our souls, and he makes our lives new with the power of that resurrection as a risen Savior, the gospel. But I want to linger upon this thought particularly. The gospel sets before us what God is saying. And in the gospel, it states clearly and plainly that Christ was going to rise from the dead. All the teaching he gives us in Mark 8, 9, and 10 sets that before us time after time. So therefore, if the resurrection did not happen, we are misrepresenting God. But it happened exactly as he said it would. 
So therefore, the resurrection is of vital importance for the veracity, for the simple trustworthiness and reputation of God. This book is true. And all that it says, we can rely upon and trust in. It's difficult at times to take it. Promises are given that are so amazing and so astonishing. The prospects before the Christian can baffle us at times. But the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that God speaks of and accomplished in his resurrection. And that same power is in operation in the life of everyone who believes and trusts in Jesus Christ. The prayer that Paul gives us in Ephesians chapter 1, 19, that's the very prayer that we might know the power of that resurrection. The power that raised him from the dead. That's the power that God deploys for the good of his people. We can be sometimes, when we're confronted with our sin, we can be downcast and despondent. We can be guilty in our soul. We're looking for some relief and respite. We're looking for something that will put our souls right, remove that sin. The way the many doors and options we try, they close in our face time after time after time. And we're brought to the end of the avenue and there's only one door open. There's only one name given underneath heaven whereby we must be saved. That is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on a cross, but he rose again. And God is saying that he will accept us as we trust in him because he's well pleased with him. That's the reputation and the credentials of our God at risk And the resurrection established these credentials and enables us to trust and rely upon him and what he has said. There is indeed a great hope for the believer. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks to your soul and mine. He tells us what he's achieved on the cross. And as we said at the beginning, we asked the question, Is it acceptable? Yes, it is. The reputation of God is at risk. We take him at his word. And we come and we seek pardon and forgiveness for the sake of Jesus Christ alone. So yes, the resurrection speaks about the work of Jesus Christ, seal and approval. It speaks about the gospel and it gives substance to the gospel, its anointing power. What other lessons can we get? Well, let's say something, the resurrection speaks also about the Christian ourselves. The Lord Jesus Christ came to do the will of his Father. And what was that will? That he was going to lose none of those that were given to him. 99% was not enough for the Lord. He was given those as a gift by the Father and every single one of them was going to be redeemed and saved and raised up. And we're told in Romans chapter 4, 25 that the resurrection of Jesus Christ seals the justification of God's people. We are justified in God's sight because of what the resurrection signifies and brings. Going back to what was said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So therefore that work that Jesus Christ did as our substitute, taking our place, obeying the word, obeying every single thing that God had said before us, we defaulted on it 
But Jesus discharged them fully and perfectly. And he gave his life as a sacrifice on the cross. We can therefore, as we trust in him, we go free. That is our justification. That is our stance, our argument before God. That is our only hope, our only confidence. That finished and that perfect work. And we're told also that Jesus Christ is our, he is the first fruits of so many that will follow him. And what that means is that what happened to him will happen to his people. And what happened to him? He was raised from the dead. So therefore it will be the same that will happen to every Christian. We will be raised just as Jesus Christ was raised. He's gone to prepare a place for his people. He waits on the far shore to welcome each one into that place he's prepared. He gives us the cloak and robe of his own righteousness as a wedding garment to be in the presence of God. And when the last assize is engaged and judgment is to be brought about, the one argument that we have, the one argument alone which we'll deploy, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The assurance of our justification, the assurance of our resurrection. And one last thought. Our judgment, or at least judgment to come. The book of Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31 speaks about that very subject. God has appointed a time when judgment will take place. And he has appointed Jesus Christ to be the judge. And there is tied in with that whole appointment, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That responsibility is given to Jesus because he alone, he alone is the perfect template. He alone is the fulfillment of all that God requires. Judgment will be his because of that perfection. So therefore, God is speaking again to us. Are we ready? Are we prepared for that judgment to be engaged. Our soul is at risk. Can we be sure that all is well? Can we be sure that God will accept us? God has made that declaration and we've got to cling on to it and hold it and use it. This is the only name the Father will accept. This is the only work that will pass the scrutiny of God in that great assize of judgment on the last day. This and this alone is the argument that will stand the test. I am trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. The past has been dealt with in his death. We are dressed in the wedding garment of his righteousness to appear before a holy God. And on that last day when a size is engaged and the books are opened, the argument we deploy is we trust and rely upon Jesus Christ. God is speaking clearly, loudly. God is speaking simply to every one of us on the vital matters of our soul. And he's doing it through this resurrection. Because that resurrection speaks clearly. There is only one way and one way of entry into the presence of God. 
that work accomplished, achieved, approved by God. That alone has to be our hope and our confidence today and especially on that last day. Let us pray. O Lord, our gracious God, again we bless thy name for thy word as it has been given to us and as it comes home to our soul once again this day, familiar as we are with it. Nevertheless, Lord, we pray. We pray that thy blessing would come to bring it home with power to us, challenging us, disturbing us as necessary, and that we might know what it is of spiritual truth and reality breaking into our life and our living. Deal with each one of us in thy grace, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We close this morning by singing from Psalm 68 and at verse 18. Psalm 68 at 18 to 24 stands as thou hast, O Lord, most glorious, ascended up on high, and in triumph victorious led captive captivity. Thou hast received gifts for men, for such as did rebel, yea, even for them that God the Lord in the midst of them might well. Blessed be the Lord, who is to us of our salvation God, who daily with his benefits as plenteously doth load. He of salvation is the God who is our God most strong, and unto God the Lord from death, the issues do belong. 68, 18 to 20, thou hast, O Lord, most glorious. may grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with you all. Amen. <laughs>